Okay, so let's start from uh, one uh, set of considerations. I mean, the autophagic pathway in many steps is uh, more and more found altered in uh, neuro neurodegenerative diseases. So here is a schematic from a recent review from Ralph Nixon in which he goes and uh, detail, and it's actually a nice review that you should read if you're interested for people that haven't done it already, uh, in which he details all the very steps of autophagy and endolysosomal degradation at which there is some involvement uh, in neurodegenerative disease. So all these little red uh, points uh, uh, with uh, uh, acronyms uh, are where uh, it is uh, thought to be a point of uh, misactivity uh, in, uh, let's say, Parkinson's disease, ALS, uh, Alzheimer's disease, as we have uh, also heard. Uh, so, so as you can see, I mean, this is the start of uh, autophagy, uh, and uh, uh, there is already quite some uh, involvement. This is in the case of aggregates, and clearly this is relevant for, for ALS. This is at the level of uh, mitophagy, which is a specialized type of autophagy, autophagy that has to do with uh, degradation of uh, mitochondria, and here there is an involvement uh, in Parkinson and SCA uh, through uh, uh, altered activity of Parkinson, which is another adapter for autophagy. Uh, then there is quite some involvement for this particular kind of autophagy uh, called CMA. Uh, this is also referred as uh, a chaperone-mediated autophagy. It is a very specialized type of autophagy in which you don't form an autophagosome, but what you do is you target a protein, a limited set of protein that has uh, this uh, uh, peptide here through HC70, so a chaperone, through a channel on the surface of the late endosome, actually of the lysosome, uh, called LAM2A, and then you es essentially bring in the protein that needs to be degraded. And again, there are lots of points here in which uh, there has been shown uh, in an involvement in, in uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, aging. And, and so forth. And I mean, through some collaboration, we have done some work related to this part uh, in which we uh, talk about uh, aggregated proteins and uh, specifically in terms of tau with uh, a mouse group in Paris, we actually looked at uh, tau trafficking in transgenic mice uh, that express a lot of tau in the nervous system and uh, it, the striking finding here was that when tau is at the level of oligomerization, so it's still it's not soluble anymore, but is not found in long fibrils, uh, there is quite some clearance of uh, the oligomeric tau by autophagy, as you can see here in this panel. So this is uh, the mammalian ATG8, uh, which is called LC3, and here it acts as a marker of autophagy. And this is catepsin D, which probably you cannot read, which is a component of the lysosome. And as you can see, the oligomeric tau is present in uh, autophagosomes that have rich a lysosomal mm -hmm. component. So to say that uh, presumably in the case of an insult, by uh, that can lead to neurodegeneration, uh, like in Alzheimer, the autophagic and lysosome assistant are fully engaged, and you really need to keep them alive and healthy for as long as you can to keep and prevent uh, uh, neurodegeneration and neuronal demise. Uh, so, so uh, another set of steps that are targeted in uh, neurogenerative diseases is actually the step of trafficking of uh, uh, autophagosomes and uh, uh, lysosomes and uh, uh, late endosomes. And here, this has to do with the fact that neurons are huge cells, right? And uh, an autophagosomes that need uh, to clear some material can originate uh, everywhere within these cells. And when it does that at the synaptic terminal, for instance, uh, when you have uh, uh, actually an autophagosome 
forming there, which is maybe could be something that could happen in that case when you're talking about quality control. These things could be taken up, for instance, by autophagosomes. It has to travel, or by, by uh, MVBs, by late endosomes, it has to travel back to the cell body because most of the lysosomes are actually sitting in the cell body. And also in the case of the lysosomes, they normally sit in the periphery and they try to move towards the cell center, so there is some movement also of lysosomes, and also this seems to be disru disrupted in a number of neurodegenerative diseases. So, so again, it's another example in which you want to keep the system uh, going also in terms of logistics of the system uh, down to clearance and degradation. And, uh, Finally, uh, there is a huge number of rare diseases that involve neurodegeneration on top of uh, 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 Parkinson and Alzheimer and others, which are the so-called lysosomal storage disease. Here you can see a, a partial list of them. And this lysosomal storage disease or lysosomal disease essentially I have to do with the disturbances and mutations that affect components of the lysosomes which uh, uh, render the lysosome uh, disabled for specific functions. And again, this has a problem per se that uh, can result in neurodegeneration. Not all the lysosomal diseases have a phenotype in the nervous system. Uh, a lot of them also have phenotypes in the muscles, but there is a quite a sizable amount that have a clear uh, neurodegenerative problem. And, uh, um, and, uh, um, and these involve, as we will see, also function of the vacuum TPAs. So, I mean, to come back to the flies, uh, what uh, is uh, interesting is that uh, the flies have been quite a good model for the neurodegeneration early on for this uh, feature that uh, you can look at mutants and it's been realized fairly early that uh, genes that specifically affect autophagy, like uh, ATG genes, uh, uh, don't lead uh, to lethality when mutated. So you can make a fly, pretty much you can make a fly that lacks the TBPH, you can make a fly that lacks, uh, for instance, ATG13, as I've shown you before, but you can make a fly also that lacks ATG7, which is a central inducer of uh, autophagy, uh, and this fly will be alive. And this is from a classical study by uh, Tom Neufel and, and Gabor Jugatz in Drosophila. This is, for instance, uh, flies, adult flies that lack uh, uh, a TG7. Uh, they survive, but uh, they clearly show a problem uh, uh, to cope with starvation. So if you uh, uh, keep nutrients in the system, they are fairly alive and well, but if uh, you need uh, to put uh, uh, some uh, uh, autophagy to recover nutrients, then uh, they, they, they don't survive and, and they die prematurely. Uh, they also have uh, a problem with oxidative stress, uh, which is probably connected with, uh, again, problems in, uh, in uh, mitophagy and problems with aggregated protein that can put some oxidative stress into the system. And this is clearly shown here. You can do a, a, a treatment with paraqua, which gives an oxidative stress to, to uh, the animals, and again, the uh, wild type flies will survive, not very long, but they will try to f put up a fight. A TG7 flies uh, die earlier because they cannot really use autophagy to try to contrast uh, oxidative stress. Uh, then uh, another fascinating aspect is that they have a shorter lifespan and this again suggests that even if you put uh, full nutrition in the system, a certain level of autophagy is required to keep the tissue healthy and presumably to make a good use of uh, your uh, internal storage so that uh, you can uh, have uh, uh, an extended uh, uh, lifetime. Um, the neurodegenerative part is also there, and this was quite clear in climbing assays. So the uh, TG7 mutant flies have uh, uh, climbing defects that come up uh, through aging. So 
uh, early on you have no problem, so at birth, let's say, you are more or less okay, but then the flies around the midlife, uh, they are uh, really struggling with uh, 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 their, their motor function, and the same is true for architecture of the brain. So here is a, a section through an adult brain of a wild type, and here is a section through an ATG7 mutant, pretty much at uh, alpha life. And as you can see, there is a number of uh, what we call buckles, which are areas in which the neurons have been lost uh, um, because of neurodegeneration. So, so this is again to say that uh, autophagy in general is uh, uh, a, a protective system to the neurons uh, and is a protective system uh, that, uh, that you want to keep as healthy as possible because not only important per se but is important to cope with all these insults and problems that you can uh, uh, go through life uh, like uh, you know aggregated proteins, uh, uh, oxidative challenges and all sorts of these things. Um, uh, in, interestingly, for reasons that we don't fully understand, uh, most of the components of this proteostasis system, this includes autophagy genes and a number of genes that are related also to endocytosis tend to decrease in expression through life. And so there seem to be uh, a reason why uh, the protection of the nervous system goes uh, uh, decreasing. And this uh, seems to correlate with the, the natural uh, ap appearance of neurodegeneration, which occurs spontaneously through life. Okay, as you can see it also here. If you take flies that are already at midlife, they are much less as, as, uh, efficient in climbing than uh, young flies uh, per se, without having to uh, go through any type of mutation. So in uh, the next couple of slides I'm going to show you what uh, a, a little unpublished set of data in which we looked specifically at the fly model of uh, lysosomal disease uh, because we are interested in, in, in uh, rare disease and we uh, uh, decided to look at those and uh, uh, since we do a lot of uh, work around the lysosome we started from that. Uh, we uh, were interested in, uh, in uh, specifically in catepsin F. Catepsin F is mutated in uh, mutant in, uh, in humans and it causes a very rare disease called the type B calf disease. This is a late onset uh, uh, neuronal steroid lipofusinosis, which is a difficult term that means essentially that uh, you have deposits of lipofusin in the nervous system that come up much earlier than normally. This is again, uh, lipofusin is essentially a lysosomal, uh, a non-degradable lysosomal metabolite that uh, accumulates uh, through life and normally accumulates at very low levels, so you, you live through that till you live no more, essentially. Uh, but uh, it doesn't cause much of damage, whereas in uh, these uh, patients, uh, because of the mutations that you have in the catepsin F that tend to inactivate uh, catepsin F, uh, as you can see here, so here you have a cleavage of uh, catepsin F uh, substrate called LIMP2 and as you can see in the wild type you get cleavage and so you get uh, an active catepsin whereas in uh, these uh, uh, mutations that correlate with disease in humans you have lost uh, the cleavage ability. So in these uh, uh, patients uh, you have a strong accumulation of lipofusin in the brain uh, uh, at midlife, which normally you shouldn't have, and you can see that because the lipofusin is autofluorescent, and so in uh, little slices of the brain you can see the autofluorescence coming up, and this is coming from a mouse model uh, of uh, 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 of catepsin F, uh, which has an interesting story. It was actually a catepsin F mutant uh, that they studied for characterization of catepsin F, in which they found uh, that there was a neurodegeneration and a neuromuscular muscular problem 
And here you can see the mutant mice, here you see the footsteps or the post steps, and as you can see here there's a normal, uh, you know, walking, whereas uh, here you see that uh, they carry uh, their legs and they uh, deambulate very poorly. And this is because of the neurogeneration. The funny thing was that at that time when they look at that, they didn't know that there were actually human patients with the disease, so the model was a sort of uh, predating, or the mutant analysis was sort of predating uh, the appearance of the disease. So we wanted to make a Drosophila model of that, uh, and in order to do that, we uh, look at the homologue of uh, uh, catepsin F, which was uncharacterizing Drosophila, uh, it has this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, code, and what we have done, we use a CRISPR-Cas9 to target the gene and generate uh, in DELs uh, that put uh, out of frame the coding sequence uh, so that uh, we generate premature stop codons uh, that ablate uh, the enzymatic domain, which is this one here in yellow. So essentially we make a dead catepsin uh, which cannot uh, uh, act, uh, pretty much like you see uh, in the humans. And uh, actually these uh, catepsis not even made as we can see here by uh, RT-PCR, uh, and this is presumably because the, in the creation of uh, a premature stop codon here triggers nonsense mediated decay, and so as you can see, in these three different mutants there is uh, very little RNA expression compared to wild type. So you are basically looking at a knockout for catepsin F. Uh, reassuringly, when we look at the autofluorescence, we found that uh, in, uh, already in the larvae, so here is a wing imaginal disc, uh, in wing imaginal discs uh, of uh, the mutants in homozygosity, you had uh, an accumulation of, uh, 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 of autofluorescent material, uh, suggesting that the lysosomes were not really working and started to create this uh, metabolite in large quantities from early during development. And uh, uh, I'm not going to show here, but the flies, pretty much like the TBPH flies, are uh, 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 coming out with uh, as homozygous without a, an, a visible phenotype. Uh, so pretty much like in the uh, uh, mutant uh, in the patients you can sort of live and be born without the catepsin F, but they do show uh, signs of uh, neuromotor defects. Uh, this is again a climbing assay, and here you can see in black uh, young flies and in gray uh, uh, older flies, and as you can see relative to the control uh, in the mutant flies you have a much reduced ability to climb up the tube, uh, indicating that there is a problem. And uh, similarly to what I showed you for ITG7, uh, in the mutants we have a number of vacuoles that appear in the nervous system, which uh, you don't see in controls. So they undergo neurodegeneration pretty much like in uh, mutant uh, uh, in, in the patients. Now, um, we tested also the resistance to oxidative stress. Uh, so instead of using paraquat, we use uh, uh, H2O2 uh, as a, a generator of oxidation. And what you can see here is that in young flies, so around 15 days, there is basically no difference between the control and the mutants. Uh, around 25 days, so as the flies age, you start to see quite some difference, indicating that uh, then uh, here you're starting to see a problem. And then if you look at uh, uh, older flies around uh, from 35 days on, there is no difference anymore, again, suggesting that uh, up to a certain point when also uh, you are uh, old enough uh, to not be able to fight oxidative stress, it not, does not really matter. Uh, whether you are mutant or wild type. And I have to say, it's not show, shown here, that uh, in this case we also don't see much of uh, lifespan reduction, uh, which uh, uh, it's debated whether, it, whether it's a problem in the patients or not. Uh, the patients live a little shorter, but it's not one of these diseases that uh, will uh, kill you when you are 40, luckily. 
Okay. Um, uh, now we are in the process of trying to understand whether there is uh, some connection between, okay, so in general we would like to understand what is the molecular mechanism, so what, what is going wrong in the lysosome. Uh, so what is uh, not cleaved uh, and what uh, the potential missing target uh, is doing and for this we are starting to look into this known target that is called MIM2. But then we also would like to understand what is the connection with autophagy because again if there is a, a defective lysosome this might be sensed by the system as something that does not work and the system might tend to compensate. And so we started to look at autophagy. Here I'm showing uh, the uh, uh, Western blot for P62, which is again an adapter for autophagy, and here for a TG8, which is uh, the fly homologue of FC3. And what we can see is that in all the mutants there is less, and these are brain extract from, from old flies or so mid-age flies, uh, there is much less uh, P62 uh, compared to wild type, uh, and uh, for uh, the LC3, uh, we don't really know what is going on because two lines have a little less induction of autophagy compared to control. Uh, in terms of autophagy, when you look at these blots, this is the lipidated form and this is the unlipidated form. So the top band is sort of the form that uh, uh, indicates premature autophagosomes that are not fully formed, whereas these uh, should indicate indicates fully formed autophagosomes. And people that work in the autophagy field uh, use the ratio between the top band and the bottom band to indicate uh, a flux in autophagy. And normally what you should do is really look at both this and that uh, with the idea that uh, if autophagy works, uh, these uh, should be kept uh, at a certain floating point, whereas if you stop autophagy, this should accumulate. If you accelerate autophagy, this should go down. So you should always look at these two blots together to understand what's going on. And the moment we don't really understand what's going on, because uh, you have less uh, P62 accumulation, but uh, it seems a little less induction of autophagy, at least for two out of three. This is really weird and we don't really understand uh, what is going on with this mutant, but uh, in two out of three, uh, the tentative conclusion is that there is a little bit of a dumb autophagy that is not activated as it should, uh, so that uh, you don't get uh, a creation of uh, that much cargoes and you don't get that much of uh, uh, flux going, but this is a sort of very preliminary and we need uh, to understand much better what is going on. So I will leave you with, the, with the, that for this uh, little model of uh, uh, lysosomal disease and an, as an example of what you can do with a targeted approach now that you can deploy crispr cas one Cas9 to mutate the gene at will, okay? So in the second part, uh, I will discuss uh, a study that we have published recently, uh, um, that has to do with the coordination um, between VATPAs and TFAB, so we are back to these. And I think it's an interesting story because as you will see, it will go into not the regulation really of uh, a lysosomal function, but it will show you a connection between this system and development. Okay, so, so again, here I talk a lot in the introduction and in the first lecture about uh, the system as a sort of a, a compensator for nutrients, but then you have to think that uh, this plastic machine in which you can uh, change uh, inputs and outputs can put at uh, uh, work, uh, can be put at work through development to enact uh, developmental changes. And in this uh, story I would like to convince you of that. So the story starts with our attempt at characterizing uh, TFEB in Drosophila. Uh, uh, TFEB was not really characterized in Drosophila, people have not looked at that, and uh, uh, we only knew at the beginning of the work that there was an homologue uh, called MITF 
But the story was kind of interesting because in, uh, it turns out that in humans there are several variants of TFEB. The one that I'm talking about is one, but then there is uh, others, and one of that is actually called MITF. And uh, the MITF, the human MITF, is actually a developmental gene. So it's uh, very important uh, during development uh, of uh, uh, the eye. And uh, it's associated to uh, tumors when it's not functioning, especially in melanomas. So it does not really look like your housekeeping uh, thing that might uh, really act at the lysosome. And so I was sort of attracted because I said, okay, here is the case in which Drosophila is an interesting system because for like four genes that there are in humans, again, there is only one. And so is it possible that this MITF is actually doing this and is controlling development? And if so, are the two things connected? And it turns out that uh, they are. Uh, so we started by checking the basic expectation that we had from TFEB. So we wanted to understand whether Drosophila, uh, uh, the MITF in Drosophila, so the homologue of TFEB is actually able to uh, modulate the expression of target genes. And target genes of TFEBs are lysosomal genes and uh, autophagy genes. In terms of lysosomal genes, what we knew that uh, among the targets were all the lysosomal, uh, 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 all the vacuolar RTPase components. So this gene is uh, a component, uh, is encoding a subunit of the VATPase that you have seen in the cartoon in the previous lecture. And what we have done here, we have used a driver that expresses in this part of the wing disc, uh, that is called wing pouch, to overexpress MITF. And this is an in situ hybridization for a probe that uh, goes to the expression of this gene. And as you can see, when you overexpress MITF, you have a strong and massive increase of expression of the VATPase component. So that suggests that uh, the genes, the target genes, can be controlled also in Drosophila, uh, like they uh, happen to be controlled in humans. And when you redo the experiment or do a similar experiment by looking at qPCR, by looking at extracts uh, in flies that have uh, expressed MITF like this, you see that there is quite a broad range of genes that are upregulated, which include most of the, uh, or most, uh, selection of the ATPS genes. And uh, when we publish these, uh, we publish back to back with a group of Andrea Ballabio. Uh, and uh, one bought us in, uh, at the Baylor College where they look at a very large set of genes and they've shown that uh, any target gene that could find upregulated in human cells could be found upregulated also in Drosophila cells. So the system really seems to be conserved. In this part here we have expressed a dominant negative version of MITF which uh, uh, cannot uh, 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 bind the DNA, so it's presumably sequestering partners, uh, but it's not really acting as a transcription factor, and in this case there is no upregulation of target genes. Now, uh, in the context of this, uh, we actually looked at the development of structures that arise in the wing disc. Uh, so, so the wing disc uh, is actually making the wing, the inch of the wing and the notum, so part of the thorax of the, of the fly. So within the wing pouch, which is uh, shown here, there is a number of structures that will be the structures that uh, you see in the adult wing. For instance, in red you have the margin, in green you have the veins. Uh, and uh, we were interested, for instance, that will become obvious in a minute, in uh, these clusters that are called proneural clusters, which are uh, essentially sets of cells that are put aside to make uh, sensory organs uh, around the margin of the fly, that the fly will use then to sense the air when it flies. Um, and again, as I showed you before, we have tools uh, to act uh, in the system. We can mis-express things in the uh, imaginal disks to essentially see what is the result. Um, 
One thing that uh, became interesting at the beginning, and is, this is the reason why we pointed our attention to the sensory organ precursor called SOPs, is that essentially when we looked at uh, a sensor for expression of VATPase components, uh, here is uh, one gene in particular called VHA16-1, uh, which makes uh, the C subunit of the VATPase, uh, a part that is important for passing the proton through the membrane. This is a GFP insertion in the locus that uh, records essentially the expression levels. You can see that uh, the pattern of expression in the disk, in the area where you have the SOPs, is not uniform, but there is actually a high expression of uh, this VATPase component in the SOP. And uh, so we suspected that uh, this uh, different level of expression might be dictated by uh, MITF in some way, and so we wanted to see whether modulating expression of MITF would actually change the pattern of these SOPs. And so we did the, the manipulation that I showed you before, where you overexpress MITF. Here the level of G expression goes massively up, similar to the in situ that I showed you, because really the gene is upregulated in its expression when you have a lot of MITF in the system. Uh, as you know, as it does as a lysosomal biogenesis gene. But as you can see also, the pattern of the SOPs in the disk becomes really strongly altered, suggesting that when you interfere with the expression of the ATPase by acting on MITF, you are also activating, you are also mis- uh, uh, or, or altering the patterning that is there. More importantly, when we overexpress a dominant negative version, we observe a, a very peculiar loss of the patterning. Uh, so the, the uh, SOPs are still forming, although there is a defect also in this case, but as you can see, uh, there is no enrichment of VATPase expression in, that you can see in control around the SOPs. This uh, really suggests uh, that uh, MITF is really required for the upregulation, and the upregulation is also relevant uh, for placing, correct placing of the SOPs. Uh, now, the correct placing of the SOPs is uh, quite a well-studied system in Drosophila. Uh, this has been a paradigm of uh, patterning, and so there's a lot of work that has been done uh, on this, and I'm going to just uh, quickly summarize it. So, initially, you have something that is called a preneural cluster around these areas, which is essentially a set of cells that are committed to become neurons, uh, of which you want to only select one in the center. And uh, essentially, the way you restrict uh, this commitment is by creating an imbalance uh, that is not really understood, uh, uh, to the uh, effect of uh, raising the expression of uh, ligand for notch signaling that is called delta in uh, the central cell that will become the SOP. Uh, and then uh, this will signal to the nearby cells to revert to an epithelial phase, so they are not neuron normal. Okay? And uh, uh, we can illustrate that uh, very easily by looking at uh, the adult structure, so this is the margin of the wing, uh, and here is the SOPs uh, in the adults, which are all placed very well spaced, uh, thanks to this uh, system that uh, sets discrete uh, uh, SOPs at certain positions. Now, if we mis-express uh, uh, a gene that is a target of notch uh, that enacts the activation of the signaling, so the signaling is not activated as strongly, as you can see the SOPs are coming off much more frequently because the, there is no, say, uh, 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 repression of the epithelial fate in the cells nearby the SOPs. Whereas if you have uh, an expression of uh, a target that uh, uh, repressed the induction of the signaling, basically you have no SOPs and everything is, or very few SOPs, everything is bold, okay? So the notch signal is very critical for that. 
And uh, so, and uh, so, what we wanted to understand is whether this uh, uh, MITF system linked to the VATPA's expression was actually altering the adult structure, like we have seen in the disks. And so, we look at the margin, and essentially, uh, as you can see, when you decrease the expression of the VATPA's, so you are removing that excess that you have in the forming system then uh, you seem to have a tightening or, a, or a, a closer spacing of the SOPs, as you can see. So there is uh, uh, SOPs that are forming closer, indicating that uh, that elevated level of the ATPs expression in those cells is important for transducing uh, this signaling potentially. And uh, if you overexpress the TFEB, uh, which will send the VATPA's expression up, as we have seen before, then you have uh, alteration that leads to either no formation or excessive spacing. There is only few SOPs. There is also other alteration here. You can see a, an ectopic SOP that is placed in other places, and this is also what we see in the disk. So clearly, it seems that uh, uh, there is uh, some connection between the lysosomal machine uh, through TFEB and the VATPAs and uh, notch signaling, which is important uh, uh, for the developmental phase. And this is uh, not so far-fetched. Uh, so this is a uh, schematics from a review some, some years ago in which you see the life, the, let's say, the cell biology of notch. Notch is a receptor, as I told you also in the initial uh, lecture. It is present mostly on the plasma membrane. It's put there and uh, it undergoes a degradation through the multivesicular body and the lysosome uh, and uh, this happens more or less all the time. This is the reason why we use it as a marker uh, in, many, in, in many experiments. But uh, in this cycle you also have the activation of signaling that occurs through cleavage of uh, the, the cytoplasmic part of the receptor that goes through the nucleus. And we know from other experiments that I have no time to show you today that the, the cleavage is not only happening at the plasma membrane but is also happening as the notch traffic through the early endosome and becomes uh, 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 degraded. So there is a tug of war between activation and degradation of the receptor that uh, seems to occur more or less on uh, route uh, to the endosome. So again, it's not so inconceivable to think that if you have a set of genes that are going to alter the amount of lysosome and the level of uh, lysosomal activity or late endosomal activity through VATPAs and TFEB, you might uh, create disturbances in notch signaling. And perhaps this is not only pathology, but is also physiologic regulation of notch signaling. This is what we believe. Right, so, so, so this, is, this is evidence that uh, we and others have uh, uh, published before this work that indicated that the VATPAs per se is required to sustain notch signaling, and this is probably has to do with these bits of uh, activation that occurs in the, in the endosome. So if you uh, uh, decrease or ablate completely VATPA's activity from the cells, you reduce strong in notch signaling activation, and uh, this uh, occurs also in an oncogenic context in which notch is uh, uh, constitutively activated. Now, we found other relationship between notch and uh, the VATPA's uh, uh, TFEB system. So for instance, this is another example. So this here in red is the pattern of activation of notch signaling within the disc. This is a well-known pattern. For instance, uh, we know very well from previous studies that there is an activation at the margin because notch is also important for making the margin. Uh, there is uh, some activation, as you can see here, around uh, the SOPs at the anterior, which is this one. There is some activation in stripes where the veins are forming. And essentially, when you look at the expression of VATPA's components, the patterning is complementary. So wherever there is a notch up, the VATPA's expression is down. This is more obvious in the vein here. I'm not showing you the uh, uh, 
localization because it, it gets a bit confusing, but you have to believe me, when a notch is up, the VATPS is down and vice versa. And the idea that we are playing with now is that uh, there is uh, differences in which our notch is handled in cells around the SOPs uh, that uh, boil down to differences, developmental differences in lysosomes. For instance, this here is a lysotracker tra incorporation in the disk and what we have found is that uh, the proneural clusters that are making SOPs uh, seems to have more uh, lysosomes uh, than uh, surrounding epithelial cells uh, for reasons that uh, we don't understand but what we think is that uh, this correlates with the notch activation so in order to illustrate that what we have used is a uh, traffic light notch in which there is uh, attached to notch a functional version of notch that can rescue there is attached a GFP and an M-cherry and the idea of this uh, sensor is that when notch is uh, traffic on the plasma membrane is mostly green because the M-cherry is really slow folding and so you see a young notch molecule on the plasma membrane and then as it traffic into the endosome it becomes progressively red because this is made whereas uh, this uh, becomes progressively degraded when notch is put within the lumen of acidic compartments and the GFP becomes uh, quenched and eventually also degraded. Uh, so this, uh, with this traffic light uh, the notch, which is essentially a lifetime sensor for notch, what we see in the disk is that while uh, the apical, again, notch that is in the disk is essentially green, uh, the notch that is around the SOPs uh, tend to be red and sitting uh, presumably in these lysosomes that you see here. Uh, so, so, what we think is that uh, maybe by changing the lysosomal content, the amount of notch that uh, sits and can be activated in lysosome changes, and this could create an extra push to uh, uh, level the level of activation of notch signaling to ensure the correct spacing of the organs. Now, again, this complementarity is visible in expression of uh, other uh, between uh, VATPAs and notch by expression also of activated notch. So again, you have a striking opposite effect. So here we are overexpressing MITF and this is a sensor for another VATPAs component. Also this one goes up, but then if we overexpress notch in the central part of the pouch here, uh, the level of expression of the ATPs that you have goes down. So again, this system of support seems to be in a sort of feedback loop as well uh, that might ensure correct development. And uh, again, this goes end in end with changes in the lysosome. So if we overexpress MITF, we make more and larger lysosomes. So this is lysotracker within the disk in this area. Whereas uh, when we overexpress notch, we have fainter and, uh, and less lysosomes. And this is quantified here. So essentially the systems are in sync and what we think is going on is uh, this one, that uh, the lysosomal compartment uh, that can be uh, bloated up or reduced through the use of TFEB and uh, VATPAs is somehow supporting notch signaling and then uh, that might be a reverse feedback loop uh, that uh, tends to shut off uh, when you have reached an appropriate level of uh, uh, notch signaling activation. So, so, so there are two important points here. So one is that the developmental function of TFEB uh, uh, and the MITF in flies are merged on a, on a single molecule suggesting that really the system evolves uh, with uh, both uh, capabilities or that simply the lysosomal homeostatic system can be deployed to uh, change development uh, and, uh, um, and also that the regulation of ATPs expression is really more complex than we previously appreciate because uh, different subunits have different patterns so there is uh, potentially more inputs 
uh, uh, compared to uh, simply regulation by TFEB. All right, so in the last few slides, uh, uh, really the last five minutes, I'm going to show you still some preliminary data that uh, relate on uh, VATPAs. Uh, and uh, in this case, we are really looking in glial cells. Uh, this comes from the fact that glial cells, again, they have uh, uh, in some cases also microglia functions, and so they are also uh, important for clearing uh, uh, debris, and potentially they have. Uh, um, uh, itened lysosomal function and itened autophagy. And in fact, what we have done here is that uh, we uh, uh, use uh, a repo system to label the glia, and this is in larvae, so this is part of an optic lobe, and here you can see the superficial glia that you have in larvae. The red parts are essentially uh, neurons. Uh, and uh, what you can see here, here is actually DAPI, but you know, believe me, the part that is not green here is mostly neurons. Uh, and uh, essentially, what you see here is that uh, if we look at this sensor of expression of the ATPase components, there is a quite uh, higher expression in the superficial glia that you have uh, within the neurons. And this is true for uh, many of these uh, sensors that monitor the expression of the ATPase components suggesting that the glia has higher level of VATPAs compared to uh, uh, the, the neurons. Then we got interested in understanding what happens actually in uh, gliomas, so glial tumors. And the reason for this is that uh, the majority of glioblastoma, so uh, very aggressive tumors of the glia, have uh, dysregulation of uh, the nutrient system. So the majority of the mutations that you find are uh, usually two hits. One if is, uh, is uh, in the EGFR system, which is a mitogenic, a non-mitogen. Uh, and uh, another one is in the AKT system and PA3 kinase system, which regulates systemic nutrition. And in fact, uh, we can mimic that in flies. We borrowed a system from uh, uh, René Reed, so here you can see the whole cephalic complex in a larva, and I actually brought, brought some samples, so perhaps we can look at these live at the confocal uh, or the airpicks, but we can see them uh, for real at the confocal in the afternoon. Uh, so here is uh, the glial compartment in, in, uh, in uh, the cephalic complex of a larva, and uh, here you can see a larva in which we have overexpressed PI3 kinase in the activated form, and a human mutated constitutively active form of EGFR that is associated to tumors. As you can see, you can have a very large expansion of the glial compartment uh, and you mimic uh, what you get in, essentially in a glioma. So what we found quite interesting is that if you uh, deplete in the system a component of the VATPAs, and this we have done with a couple of different components, uh, in wild type uh, tissue you are not doing much I mean, if you have a strong depletion, you start to see cell death, uh, because presumably the VATPAs, uh, to some extent, is uh, uh, necessary. And again, most of the VATPAs uh, genes are essential. Uh, but the striking uh, phenotype is that if you deplete the VATPAs component in the context of the tumor, you counteract most of the growth that you get normally. You don't get a normal cephalic complex, as you can appreciate from the green, there is uh, still way too much glia, there is still lethality, so this will die uh, as larvae, as you might uh, guess, and this also will die at larvae, but uh, basically you, here is a quantification, you rescue most of the growth. So somehow the VATPA's activity is limiting in this tumoral context, uh, and uh, here is a control to show you that we are now regulating quite strongly these obligate components of the VATPAs. Now, what we find quite interesting, and again, we are going a little bit into the field of autophagy again, this is uh, still preliminary and published, uh, is that uh, the glioma is really full of P62. You can see it here. Normally we don't see much of P62 despite this increase 
in uh, the ATPase level that you have in the GRIA, so <coughs> presumably at steady state the autophagy is uh, chugging, chugging, chugging and going normally. Whereas in the glioma, you can see that there is all these very uh, prominent speckles of P62. So it seems that there is something going on with autophagy. E either it's very increased or is very uh, blocked. And we don't have the answer yet, but we are starting to uh, explore that. So one thing that we have looked at, uh, and now we are also disaggregating uh, the, 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 the brains and separating cells with facts like, like you do to actually look at that more carefully. But essentially when we look with the uh, qPCR and relative expression of autophagy genes, we don't see much of an increase in the tumor samples, but we do see a transcription increase in P62 that matches the protein increase. So we don't know why you get this, this increase in transcription, but this uh, seems to be peculiar. Actually, one way to look at this data, uh, because the, uh, in this sample, the glial cells are much more overrepresented represented relative to these, uh, is actually that uh, there is uh, uh, an increase of F2P that matches the expansion of the repo compartment, but uh, these other genes, uh, which should also be up uh, to compensate, are not up. So this makes us think that uh, actually there might be a block in autophagy in these cells and that they might, uh, through uh, whatever the glioma is doing, might need more and more autophagy to get by and that's why probably by removing the VATPAs and, you know, contrasting this clearance, potentially you create a problem to the growth of the tumor. So this would be uh, a contest in which autophagy potentially, but is still of course an hypothesis, is required to sustain the growth of the tumor. Now we are also starting to play with the MITF in this system. This again is a qPCR in which we uh, reduce the level of MITF both in the control and the tumor. We don't see much of a decrease of a set of target genes, uh, suggesting that uh, in the glia, the MITF, so TFEB, might not be a very strong regulator of autophagy. And again, we don't really know, there's not much literature published, we don't really know whether this is the, because the system is uh, used to having systemic nutrients and therefore it's not really much used compared to other tissue to buffer. Uh, with autophagy. Uh, so this is uh, still something that we need uh, to figure out. All right, so this is uh, where I wanted to lead you and this is a, a short summary. So, so uh, I showed you that multiple steps of autophagy and endolysosomal systems are altered in neurodegenerative disease, that impairment of autophagy in drosophila affects resistance to starvation, stress and it causes neurodegeneration normally. Uh, I show you how uh, mutation in lysosomal genes uh, lead to a wide range of rare lysosomal syndromes, uh, most of which are neurodegenerative. And I showed you how TFEB and the VATPA system could actually contribute to development of treproneural organs. And in the, these last few preliminary data, I showed you how fly glioma display potentially an altered autophagy and are sensitive to reduction of the ATPase activity. Just let me close by acknowledging the people in the lab. So this is a recent picture of the lab uh, on a lab outing and uh, uh, essentially the part that work on lysosomal di disease and glia are these two guys here and uh, uh, this uh, is uh, an Elena and Valeria are essentially working on the SNAP29 part uh, and Francesca uh, and, and, and Victor have been working on the, the notch part and uh, I have to acknowledge also grants and fellowship supports by all these uh, uh, charities and organizations. Thank you.